Today, uh, our last session here is Wisconsin Citizen-Based Monitoring, Volunteering for Nature. Eva Lewandowski with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources is our speaker. Eva is a conservation biologist and the Citizen-Based Monitoring Coordinator for the Wisconsin DNR. She will discuss the many ways that people can participate in citizen-based monitoring by volunteering to monitor the state's waters, plants, and animals. From listening to frog, for frog calls and searching for bumblebees to monitoring water quality and much more, there are many ways to get involved, get outdoors, and contribute to the understanding, management, and conservation of nature in Wisconsin. Learn how you can get involved and how citizen-based monitoring efforts make a difference in this state. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Eva Lewandowski. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, I wanna echo the earlier comments. Thank you to everyone who is joining us today and who has made it through to a Friday afternoon. I appreciate you hanging in and listening to this presentation. Uh, as you heard, my name is Eva Lewandowski and I am the Citizen-Based Monitoring Coordinator at the Wisconsin DNR. I'm based in Madison, so probably a fair distance away from most of you on the call. I'm going to give a quick overview of what citizen-based monitoring is and some of the resources that we have here in Wisconsin. And then we'll talk more about some of the great projects that you can volunteer with. And finally, I'll touch on some results and outcomes of these volunteer efforts. Next slide. So let's start out with a couple of definitions. The first term that I want to go over is citizen science. Citizen science is a term that you're probably hearing more and more and it really has a very broad definition. It's any form of partnership between volunteers and professionals to do science. That means members of the public are volunteering their time to do real authentic research in science. There's a lot of different roles that volunteers, oops, if we can, yeah, thank you. There's a, a lot of different roles that volunteers can play. Um, some of them are initiating projects. They're maybe asking questions about the world around them and trying to come up with experiments or monitoring projects that can answer those questions. A lot of volunteers, especially here in Wisconsin, are more interested in collecting data, but there are also volunteers who are interested in doing data analysis or maybe doing communications, education outreach, or training for a project. So there's a whole, uh, a whole array of ways people can volunteer. And there are also a wide variety of types of projects. There are citizen science projects that focus on things like linguistics and astronomy and medicine and geology. But we're going to talk today about the citizen science projects that focus on natural resources. So we're going to be talking about, you know, projects that are focused on water and plants and animals. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Here in Wisconsin, we use the term citizen-based monitoring. You've already probably heard it five times in the three minutes that we've been started here. Um, we use that term to refer to a subset of citizen science, looking at the public involvement in the long-term monitoring of our natural resources. So again, this is our plants, our animals, our waters. And you might hear me use those two terms interchangeably throughout the talk. Um, I'll try to stick to citizen-based monitoring, but if I mess up and say citizen science, um, just know that they're really pretty similar. Next slide. We're very unique and very lucky here in Wisconsin because we actually have a statewide network to support these efforts, which is something very few other states have. Uh, we have the Wisconsin Citizen-Based Monitoring Network, and you see the URL there on the screen. If you want to learn more, you can visit the website. So what the network is, is a partnership of over 190 different monitoring groups and projects that are all working on citizen-based monitoring. And the mission of the network is to improve the effectiveness of those volunteer monitoring efforts. So we try to provide as much support and as many resources as possible to make our partners successful. So we're really a support organization. We provide resources for project leaders and volunteers, for researchers who want to use citizen-based monitoring data, for land managers who want to use citizen-based monitoring, um, as well as educators and other folks who are interested. We're really trying to reach everyone in the citizen-based monitoring community. Next slide. So some of the resources that we provide include trainings, and that means both trainings for citizen-based monitors, um, maybe you want to get involved in a project and you need a training to do that, as well as trainings for professionals who are involved in the field, like 
how to find funding or how to involve your classroom in citizen-based monitoring. There are occasionally funding grants or contracts available through the network. We have some equipment lending libraries um, so that people or projects can borrow, to borrow tools if they're not able to purchase them or if they're not sure that they want to commit to a project and they want to try it out first. For example, folks can borrow things like trail cameras or acoustic bat detectors or even things like clipboards and flags for survey work. We do a lot of communications. We're on social media and we have a newsletter. You can sign up for our email list. All that is accessible through the website. Um, you, we have a, an event calendar where people can either publicize their monitoring event, like a training or a bio blitz or a talk like this, or they can find one in their area to participate in. We offer technical support and guidance. So if people are trying to start a project, for instance, and they're looking for help and resources, we can point them in the right direction. And um, I think our most popular resource is our conferences by far. Every other year we have a big statewide conference where everybody involved in the field, volunteers, educators, researchers, DNR staff all get together and we share resources and we network and we have talks and we learn from each other. Um, unfortunately, our last conference was scheduled actually for the end of March, so of course we had to cancel that, um, but we're certainly hopeful that we'll be able to have one again in the future. So that's a pretty brief overview of citizen-based monitoring in the, in the state and um, some of the resources that are available. And I hope that if you're interested in learning more, some of that will be helpful. But I think probably what a lot of you are interested in is learning about projects that you can join and get involved with. So let's go on to the next slide and we'll start with um, some of that. So we have a lot of projects available in Wisconsin. Some of them are local, some of them are statewide, some of them are national or even international projects. And I could spend all day long talking about projects that are available and not describe all of them. There are just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. So I'm going to just focus on some of the most popular projects, um, some of the biggest ones that are statewide, primarily ones that are specific to Wisconsin, and also ones that you can participate in uh, in the northwest part of the state, assuming that most of the people on the call today are, are, are living in the northwest. Um, next slide. So let's start out with some of our water monitoring projects. I'm just going to go over these very briefly because I'm thinking that a lot of people on the call or um, attending this conference are probably pretty familiar with some of them, but I'll mention them in case you're not or if you need a brief refresher. So I imagine a lot of you have heard of the Citizen Lake Monitoring Network. This is a lake monitoring project where volunteers go out and measure water quality and the data are used to make management decisions about the lakes and the surrounding lands that are affecting the lakes. Volunteers can measure things like water clarity, uh, the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water, maybe if there's invasive species present or not. And there are just so many uh, different variables that can be captured. Some of them are, are even offshore. Um, or off the lake onshore. So things like ice on and ice off dates are also being captured by this project. Because this is a project that is monitoring water quality in the lakes, for the most part, you do need boat access. There's a few things that can be done from the shore, like the ice on and ice off dates, but for the most part, you do need a boat. Um, it's a really long running and very, very large project, one of our biggest in the state. There's just hundreds and hundreds of volunteers involved. And because it is so big and um, so well supported, both by Extension and by DNR and by many uh, other partners, there are lots of support resources for new volunteers. Next slide. So our other big water project in the state is water action volunteers. And this is our stream monitoring project. Um, again, jointly run by DNR and Extension. So this is another opportunity for, for volunteers to go out and measure water quality to inform water management and land management. Volunteers are looking at things, again, like water clarity, dissolved oxygen, presence or absence of invasives, uh, maybe macroinvertebrates in the stream. This is a project that does not require a boat. It's done in weightable streams or from the shore. Uh, so it's not something that you're going to have to do, uh, for instance, in a canoe or a kayak. It's another very popular project, uh, one of the biggest in the state with hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. And it's a really good one to do with a partner or with a small group because there's a couple different tasks and for safety reasons, we always like to have people go out together if they can. 
Um, and you'll note just uh, in the picture in this slide that some of those weightable streams are also very walkable. You'll see these folks uh, during a drought season are actually just standing in the middle of their <laughs> poor stream. But a lot of the streams, of course, are in better shape than that. Um, next slide. Moving on from water to things that we find in water, in Wisconsin, we have the Wisconsin Muscle Monitoring Program, which is a citizen-based monitoring project that searches for Wisconsin's 50 native species of mussels. And a lot of people, when they think about mussels, they just think of the bad mussels. You think zebra mussels, you think, oh, invasives, these are bad. Um, but we actually have 50 species of native mussels who are doing really important things in our ecosystem and we need to monitor them. We need to know more about their distribution, their abundance, and the health of their populations. So for this project you do wade in the shallows of streams or sometimes around lakes and volunteers can participate by either collecting incidental observations which is um, more casual so oh I saw a mussel and I'm going to write it down, I'm going to take a couple photographs and then I'll report it. Or if you're looking for something more formal, we do have more structured surveys that are available um, for people looking for a more in-depth way to get involved. We do encourage people to take photos of the mussels to verify the identification. We have staff at the DNR who will look at your mussel photos and help you identify them. And there are also resources and books that are available to help you identify them. So if you're thinking one mussel looks like every other mussel to you, don't worry about that. You'll learn and there are people who will help you. Um, next slide, please. So another great project is the Wisconsin Odonata Survey. This looks at the distribution and the presence of odonates in our state. And odonates is a fancy word for dragonflies and damselflies. This is a great project to do if you're around a lake because of course, many of you know that there are lots and lots of dragonflies and damselflies around lakes and streams. They love water. Um, this is a project that really is focused on incidental observations and checklists. So there's no strict methods that you have to follow, um, no really rigid structure. You're just gonna go out and record what you're seeing and report back on that. Oftentimes people will take photos so that the identification of their dragonfly or their damselfly can be verified. The photos, uh, the photos aren't always required, but it's certainly very helpful, especially if you're just getting started or if you're trying to report on a rare species where we might need some additional documentation of that. This is a project that's run by the DNR, but it's heavily supported by the Wisconsin Dragonfly Society. And volunteers who are just starting out oftentimes get a lot of support from the Dragonfly Society. They have great mentors and lots of identification resources. Um, and they have an amazing Facebook page where people help each other ID um, the dragonflies and damselflies. And they talk about monitoring tips and things like that. So this is another project where there's a great community already there, a lot of support for new volunteers. Next slide, thanks. Um, looking at another form of insect, this is one of our newer projects and one that I co-lead, so it's quite close to my heart. It's the Wisconsin Bumblebee Brigade. This is a project looking to map and collect additional data on Wisconsin's 20 native species of bumblebees. You can either submit an incidental observation, which again is just, oh great, I saw a bumblebee, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a picture, I'm going to report it. Or if you're looking for something that's a little bit more of a challenge, we have a more complex, more formalized survey where you count and report every single bumblebee that you see within a set area. Uh, the Bumblebee Brigade is a photography-based project, so photographs are absolutely required. Um, at the DNR, my colleagues and I verify the identification of all of the bumblebee photographs that are submitted, and this is thousands and thousands of photographs. Um, they come in and we, we verify the identification, so we can't do that if there's not a photo present. This is a terrific project for anybody who's interested in nature photography. Um, and I know that there are a lot of photographer, er, phot photography enthusiasts um, throughout the state. Bumblebees and any pollinators are really just amazing and, and fun to photograph. We do specifically need help in Northwest Wisconsin. As I said earlier, it's a new project. And this is actually just our second full year and we did have to cancel our training because of the pandemic that we were going to be offering um, in the Serona area. So. We're, we're looking for some more volunteers in the northwest um, part of the state. If you could go to the next slide. So this is a map actually from last week and um, it's a map of observations that we've received so far this year. 
Um, each little bumblebee is where volunteers have submitted data. Now this is going to flesh out as the season progresses and there's more and more bumblebees present. Um, but you can definitely see that there is a gap in the northwest part of the state. So if anyone is interested and is looking for um, a way to help bumblebees or pollinators in general, I would love to have you become a volunteer with the Bumblebee Brigade. And again, if you're interested in photography, this is a perfect project as well. So let's go to the next slide. Thanks. All right, I have to apologize in advance. Every time I have to take a sip of water, it's going to take slightly more time. I'm, <laughs> I have a medical condition that requires that I lay on my back. And while I'm quite good at uh, drinking while on my back, I found that with a headset, it, pre prevents, or it presents a whole other challenge. So <laughs> if you hear lengthy delays while I'm talking, that's it. <laughs> um, all right. So another insect project, this is a very, very popular project nationally. It's the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. And what you do for this project is you go out and you count monarch eggs and larvae, and larvae are the little caterpillars, on milkweed plants. As I said, it's a national project. It's been around for over 20 years, but it is now based in Wisconsin at the UW-Madison Arboretum. So I like to include it because it has that local connection, has that Wisconsin connection. And also because Wisconsinites have actually been participating in it from the very beginning. We had volunteers from Wisconsin the very first year of the project. This is a great project to do with kids. If you're looking for something to do with your children, your grandchildren, your classroom, whatever, um, this is perfect. There are educational resources. There's actually a full curriculum guide for teachers and nature center educators. And it's just great. Um, kids love getting out and looking for monarch eggs and larvae. If you've got small kids, they're oftentimes at eye level with the, with the milkweed, uh, so they're pretty good at finding those, those little critters. And it's just exciting and fun. And of course, our monarchs are very much in decline, so we need all the data and all the information that we can get to help protect them. Next slide. The next project that I want to hit is the Christmas bird count. A lot of times if people are familiar at all with citizen science or citizen-based monitoring, they think of birds because bird projects are some of the oldest uh, that we have, not just in Wisconsin, but in the entire country. And they're oftentimes the ones with the most volunteers. The Christmas bird count is a single day count in either December or in January. You work with others and you stay in a 15 mile in diameter circle and your group tries to count all the birds that are present in that circle. Every circle has a different date. So again, it can be anywhere from mid to late December through the beginning of January, around Christmas time. That's why it's called the Christmas bird count. Um, it's a project that actually started in 1900. So it's been around for 120 years. And it's a national project, but Wisconsin participated in the very first Christmas bird count in 1900. Some volunteers from North Freedom um, went out and counted birds back in 1900. And we've had participants every year since. So it's a project that has a long history in our state and it's very near and dear to a lot of people's hearts. It's a project that a lot of people like if they don't want to make a long-term commitment. Some of the other projects that I'm talking about, um, you know, they ask you to volunteer all summer long or all year round. Um, you know, it's, it's repeated going out over and over again. And this is just a single day. So if you don't have a lot of time, but you do want to help out, this is a good option. Next slide. So another bird project that's pretty similar is the annual Midwest Crane Count. Uh, this also is, well, it's not quite national, but it's a regional project. So it encompasses a lot of states, but it is based here in Wisconsin at the International Crane Foundation by Beerboo. It's another single day count. Every April, there's one Saturday morning that people throughout the Midwest go out and they count cranes. You don't just count them, but you're also looking for breeding behavior and you're listening for breeding behavior, um, looking for them to be dancing, looking for them to be in pairs, things like that. It's great for families. Kids love looking at the cranes. Everybody loves to see those just really big majestic birds. And it's pretty easy to count them. And almost everyone knows how to identify a crane. You're usually not going to mistake uh, some other bird for a crane. Um, you're not, you're not going to think a crow or a swan is a crane. So it's, um, it's not a project that re requires a lot of additional skills. Uh, so if you're looking for something to do as a family or on your own in the spring, and again, just a single day, this is a project that I strongly recommend. Next slide. 
Um, another project that we have here in Wisconsin is the Wisconsin Frog and Toad Survey. This is the longest running acoustic frog and toad survey in the world, which we're very proud of at DNR. It's a DNR run project. Um, we're coming up on our 40 year anniversary. So next year, the project will be 40 years old, which is a big and exciting uh, anniversary and milestone for us. There are three ways that you can get involved in the frog and toad survey, but all of them, you do need to know your frog and toad calls. So it's an acoustic survey, as I said. Um, so you either need to know the calls or you need to learn them before you begin. And there are a lot of resources available to help you do that. There are lots and lots of recordings. There are quizzes that you can take to test yourself. The Wisconsin Citizen-Based Monitoring Network has really terrific videos on our YouTube channel that walk you through how to identify the calls of all the frogs and toads in the state. And those are some of our most popular resources. Um, if you do want to get involved, uh, like I said, you can choose between three options. So there are traveling surveys where you drive around and you stop at specific predetermined sites and listen for all the frogs. Um, there are mink frog surveys which are only for mink frogs. And for those, you go to specific sites that you have been assigned and you only listen for the mink frogs that are present. And the mink frogs are really only in the northern part of the state. So that's something that folks in the Northwest are certainly encouraged to do because we do need more volunteers for the mink frog surveys. Um, and that's something that we started, I think just last year. So it's a newer component um, and we don't have a lot of volunteers doing it yet. Then we have phenology surveys. Um, phenology surveys are a little bit different because we're not assigning you a location. We're not asking you to travel anywhere. You get to pick any site that you want that has frogs and toads. So if you live on a lake, it could just be sitting out on your back porch or sitting out in your yard and monitoring the frogs and toads over the course of the summer. The phenology project is really trying to find out if the timing of our frogs and toads calling is changing. So we're wondering if um, as climate change affects our, our ecosystems, if it's impacting the phenology of our frogs, when are they calling, when are they mating, when are they out? And of course, because most frogs and toads call primarily at night, most of the survey work for the frog and toad survey is at night. The mink frog surveys in particular, actually, we do ask people to go out uh, both at night and during the day because we do have some evidence that mink frogs might be calling more during the day than at night, and we want to make sure that we can capture that information. Again, this is a project where we specifically are in need of more volunteers in Northwest Wisconsin um, for, for all three of these options, for traveling, for mink frog, for phenology surveys. So if you're interested in frogs and toads, and you want to help us understand their distribution in the state, we would love to have you get involved. Next slide. Okay, so let's move on to the Wisconsin Turtle Conservation Program. This is probably one of the easiest programs that we have to get involved with. It's really something that almost anyone can do. Uh, we need volunteers to report turtle crossings. And by that, I mean where turtles are crossing roads. I'm sure everyone has seen a turtle crossing the road or trying to cross the road, whether it's unfortunately a turtle that's maybe died, um, it's been hit by a car, or uh, a turtle that has successfully made it across and, and didn't come across any danger. What we ask is that people report these crossings. So we want to know where turtles are crossing the roads in high volumes, and we want to know where they're dying when they're crossing the roads and where they're not dying. We want to know about successful crossings because that helps us understand what conditions might be safer for turtles. And we need to know about deaths on the road because um, that helps us understand what factors make it more dangerous for turtles and where we need to take action. If you don't know how to identify your turtle species, photos are helpful because we are interested not just in whether there was a turtle there, but um, what species are present. We do also accept um, just general turtle observations. So if you see a turtle and they're not crossing a road, maybe um, you see a turtle in a park or um, you know sunning itself, we, would, we accept that as well, because while that doesn't tell us much about um, you know, crossing dangers, it does help us understand distribution of our, our turtles throughout the state. And I will just say that for this project especially, but of course for all of our projects, but um, because this is done along a roadway, please, please, please be very careful. Always put your own safety first. If you're stopping to look at a turtle or to photograph it or to do anything, um, if you're on the road, just be really quite careful if you're pulling over or especially if you're getting out of your vehicle. 
put your own safety first. We don't want any harm to come to anyone um, because they wanted to collect a little bit of information for us. Next slide. So uh, we have the Volunteer Carnivore Tracking Project here. This is a project that is active in the central and northern parts of the state. So it's a great project for people living in the Northwest, like uh, probably most of you. Volunteers do track surveys for medium and large sized mammals, mostly carnivores, um, hence the name carnivore tracking. It's a winter project because the track surveys are done in the snow. As you can see in the picture, you've got these two young women who are out looking in the snow at tracks. There is a training component required. So before you go out and participate, you do have to complete the training. And the trainings are offered throughout the state, usually in the fall or early winter. Um, during the trainings, you will learn to identify tracks of all sorts, um, everything from wolves and coyotes to raccoons and possums and fisher and weasels. If it's out there in Wisconsin in the winter, you'll learn about it. It's a great project for people who are looking for something to do or looking for a way to get outdoors in the winter. And it really helps us understand the population sizes and the ranges of a lot of these mammals that we have in this state. Next slide. So here we've got another mammal project, this one looking at small mammals. It's our Wisconsin bat program monitoring. There are two ways to get involved in this. Both uh, of course happen at night. You can either go out with an acoustic bat detector, which is an electronic device that picks up the ultrasonic calls made by bats. It records the sounds heard and then we can use that to determine what species are present. Uh, in the photo here, there's a woman who is holding an acoustic bat detector. She's actually, you can't tell, but she's on the water. Um, she's in a canoe and she's out doing surveys, but you can also do them um, on foot um, from your car. We even have one person who does surveys on his bicycle. Another way to get involved is through roost monitoring. A couple times a year, early and late in the summer, Roost volunteers go out around sunset and they count the bats that emerge from roosts. The roost can be a bat house, a bridge, a silo, or anywhere that you know that has or used to have bats. Hopefully not in your own house, but if, if that's where they are, that works too. Uh, the nice thing about roost monitoring is that you can take a chair out and sit down while you're counting um, and just kind of sit back and relax. So it's quite nice for those of us who can't do a lot of walking and, and those of us who have some limited mobility. Um, bat monitoring is incredibly crucial right now. We're probably, or you've probably heard that our bats, not just in Wisconsin, but across the nation are really in a bad situation. They are declining very, very quickly. There's a disease called white nose syndrome. It's a, a fungal disease that is killing our bats as they hibernate. And it's just absolutely devastating. We've seen huge drops in bat numbers and we need all of the information that we can get on where bats are and where they are no longer present in the state. Uh, my colleagues at the DNR, we have uh, two or three before four people who are, are working on bats and um, they're hoping to eventually have some sort of vaccine or cure that we can disseminate amongst the bats that we have left. And in order to do that successfully, we're really going to need to know where the bats are at any given point in time. So this is a great way to help out and potentially collect information that's also going to be extraordinarily important in conserving our bats who are on the verge and definitely need our help. Next slide. So this project is um, Snapshot Wisconsin. It's a slightly different project. It's a trail cam camera project. There's two ways to get involved. You can either host a trail camera on your own property, which means putting up and maintaining the camera, and it would capture images of wildlife that are going past. Um, this is primarily gonna be mammals, but we also get a fair number of birds and even some things like turtles and butterflies from time to time. And it's, your camera would be part of a huge statewide network of trail cameras that are in a grid system throughout the whole state. So you can be a trail camera host or anyone, anywhere, can go online and classify the wildlife images that are coming from those cameras. So there's an option to do a kind of a more traditional outdoor volunteering experience as the trail camera host. But there's also an option to do an indoor volunteering experience. And that's really great, again, for folks who might have mobility issues or if it's just a day where the weather is terrible and you want to do something good, but you don't have uh, the urge to go outside, you know, it's thundering and lightning or it's 25 to blow or something like that. Um, 
this is something that you can do at home or your public library or in your classroom or almost anywhere if you have an internet connection. And because it's online and it's year round, uh, you can do it any time of the day or night as well. It's very popular with educators because kids love looking at these wildlife images from the cameras. A lot of educators have been able to put them up either on their own school property or on properties that are adjacent to the school so the kids can build that connection to their local landscape. There's education materials, there's great support for educators, so it's certainly a project that I recommend if you're a classroom teacher or at a nature center and you're looking for a way to get individuals and families involved. This project is helping us um, at the DNR and at UW-Madison understand population ranges for mostly mid to large mammals, but also some birds and small mammals. It's helping us understand things like what hours the day animals are most active, and it's helping us understand uh, population sizes. So it's very powerful and a very useful project. Next slide. Another project that a lot of people are engaged in is the Wisconsin First Detector, uh, excuse me, the Wisconsin First Detector Network. This is a project that is monitoring and reporting invasive species. So unlike most of the other projects that I've talked about where you kind of want to find what you're looking for, you want to go out and see those, those great native species, here you really don't want to go out and find anything. You know, we'd all prefer to go out looking for invasives and just not find any. But unfortunately, that's seldom the case. Um, we see a lot of invasives when we're out either on our own properties or along roadways. And this is a project uh, that's important because it collects information that we can use to know where to target management efforts. It also helps volunteers learn about management techniques that can, uh, they can use to manage invasives on their own. It's a project that can be done either with a smartphone app or you can report observations online. And I'm sure that you've all seen either on your own property or at a local park um, or when you're out in the water, some sort of invasive, whether it's garlic mustard or zebra mussels or buckthorn. And I'm sure you've also seen the impacts uh, that those invasives are, are having on our ecosystems. So the more data that we can get to help us understand where they are and where we need to focus our efforts, the better. Next slide. The last project that I'm going to talk about is the Wisconsin Rare Plant Monitoring Program. And this is one of the few plant citizen-based monitoring projects that are in the entire country. Um, so it's pretty unique. What volunteers do is they follow up on old records of rare plant populations. We have a lot of plants in Wisconsin that are endangered or threatened or are species of concern. And we also have a lot of historical records about those species. And by historical, I mean, Anything from a record from five or ten years ago where someone went out and they had a GPS unit and they marked exactly on a map where they were and we have a lot of good information all the way to the other end of the spectrum where sometimes we have records from a hundred years ago or 120 years ago or more where it could even just be a county record or township record. We don't have any more specifics than yes this rare plant was found in this county you know a hundred years ago. And we have volunteers who go out and try to refine those rare plant populations. They check up on them, they assess their population status, assess if there's any threats present. So first we're asking, did you find the population? Is it still there? If it is still there, how's it doing? Um, how many individual plants are there? Does it look like they're reproducing? Does it look like they're being threatened by anything like pesticides or invasives? Or maybe there's a road that's going to be built right through the population. Uh, this is a project that does require that you go through a training because the methods for collecting these data are pretty specific. But I will say that the training does not include plant ID. So we do need volunteers with plant ID skills. You don't have to be able to identify every single rare plant out there. And a lot of volunteers can't, but they have some types of plants that they know that they can uh, ID. So you might say, well, I'm really good at Forbes, or I know I can do rare lilies, or here's the 30 plants that I'm comfortable with. And our rare plant coordinator will work with you and he'll assign you historical records to follow up on that both suit your identification skills and uh, the part of the state that you're in. So we're not asking you to travel, you know, far, farther away than you want to from your house. It's a really fun project. It has a sort of investigative component that a lot of our others don't because you are following up on these old records and you're kind of searching around and you're trying to find clues from the records to where the plants might be. And if they're still there, you're looking around to, to find threats and find things out that might be impacting their status. Um, so if you have 
identification skills with rare plants, I would really encourage you um, to get involved in this project. It might be a, a great way for you to help out with some of our rare and endangered species. Next slide. So I've briefly touched on some of the main purposes for all those projects, but I didn't necessarily go into detail about how the data are used. And that is something that as a volunteer, you really need to be thinking about. If you're gonna be putting your time and your effort and your energy into volunteering for these projects, you should know what the outcomes are gonna be, what's the purpose, what's the point, how are the data that you're collecting going to be used? So in general, there are three ways that we use the data from citizen-based monitoring. The first is just basic scientific research, asking and answering questions about the world around us. The second way that the data are used is through actual on the ground management. People are making decisions about how to manage a lake or to manage a property or how to prioritize where funding goes based on data. And many times those data are going to be coming from citizen based monitoring projects. And because many of these projects are run by the DNR or in local cases, oftentimes county uh, agencies, uh, there is a regulatory component. So data are used in regular regulatory decisions at the local level, the state level, and the national level. We might use the data to determine the decision on uh, a permit application, or we might use it to determine if a species is classified as threatened or endangered and requires some form of legal protection. But the main point is that your data should be used and if you're going to get involved in a project and it doesn't explicitly say on the training materials or the website or the recruitment or, or anywhere else, what the purpose is and how your data are being used, you should ask. You know, you don't wanna get involved in a project that really hasn't thought through uh, just what it's gonna be doing with your data or isn't being responsible about how they're using your time and your energy. Um, so I have a couple examples, let's go to the next slide. So this is an example of how data from citizen-based monitoring is being used in scientific research. Um, so this is a national study that used some data from Wisconsin and some data from other parts of the country, and it was looking at the migration of the green darner. The green darner is an incredibly common dragonfly that's found throughout the country. We certainly see it here in Wisconsin. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. Um, what the researchers wanted to know was where are green darners at various points in the year? So where are they in April? Where are they in October? Where are they in December? And also, where were those dragonflies born or where did they hatch or emerge? So if dragonflies in July are here in Wisconsin, where, did, where were they born? Were they born in Wisconsin or were they born somewhere else in the country? To answer those questions, they used citizen-based monitoring data. So they used reports from various citizen-based monitoring projects, like the one I talked about earlier, the Wisconsin Odonata project, um, from volunteers for the information on where our green downers are at various times of the year. And then they also used uh, a technique called stable isotope analysis. And what stable isotope analysis is, is a type of chemical analysis that allows researchers to match a chemical sample in this case, a part of a green darner's wing, with where that sample was created. So it's a way to say, where was a green darner born or where did it emerge? Where did it hatch? So regardless of where a green darner in the study was found, the researchers were able to use this sort of analysis to determine where in the country they were emerging at that time. Um, next slide. So here's a, a, a figure showing the results and it's a little complicated, but Hopefully you, you'll get the main gist here. Um, what they found was that there's actually a three generation cycle that we didn't fully understand before. So this figure shows the location and origin of green darners at various points in the year. If you're able to see the little black dots um, on the maps on the screen, those little black dots are where volunteers reported seeing green darners. So up at the top, you've got June and July, which is right about where we are now and you know, in the calendar. Um, all those black dots are focused on the northern part of the country. You can see that there are a lot of black dots right here in Wisconsin. And what the red coloring on the map is, is the results of the stable isotope analysis. So that's showing us where those dragonflies actually came from. So interestingly, in June and July, we can see that there are actually a lot of dots for darners in the northern parts of the country, but they weren't actually born there. The red is showing us that those darners emerged or hatched further south. 
And they were able to look at this for the whole year cycle across the country. What they found, as I said, was this three generation cycle. The darners that are in Wisconsin or the green darners that are in Wisconsin right now are one generation. And they are a generation that actually migrated north from around Florida, bottom of Texas, that part of the country. They migrated north in the spring and they're going to stay in Wisconsin for a couple months. They're going to produce that next generation and die. And then that next generation that was born here in Wisconsin is going to migrate too. It's going to migrate south in late summer, early fall. And it's going to end up back in the southern part of the country around Florida, around Texas. And if you can see the maps on the right hand side of the, uh, the screen there, you'll see that in the fall, all those black dots that are present in the south, um, or the, all the black dots are present in the south, but they weren't born there. The red coloring is from Wisconsin and Minnesota and Iowa. So that's the second generation. And then that generation stays down south and they produce a third non-migratory generation. That third generation stays there for the winter, stays in the south for the whole winter, and eventually reproduces and gives birth to that new generation that then will migrate north in the spring and end up back in Wisconsin to repeat the cycle. So again, it's a three generation cycle. One generation migrates north, one generation migrates south, and one generation stays in the south and doesn't migrate. It's really fascinating, and uh, they found it out by using citizen-based monitoring data, data from volunteers. So this is a terrific example of the roles that volunteers can have in doing scientific research. Next slide. So uh, here's another example. This is an example of on-the-ground management. So it's an example from the rare plant monitoring program, which I talked about not too long ago. And you remember that the volunteers for this project are sent out to follow up on historical records of rare plants. So a couple years ago, we had some volunteers who went out to follow up on a historical record of the Eastern Prairie White Fringed Orchid, which is a federally listed plant. And you probably know orchids are very sensitive. They need really specific habitat conditions to survive. So we have volunteers who went out to find a population that had been recorded along some old railroad tracks. They walked up and down the railroad tracks trying to find the population and they did eventually find it. And again, they're actually not just saying, yep, we found it, we can go home now. They're, they're looking around and they're assessing the status, looking for threats. And what they found was some woody plants encroaching on the orchids and threatening the population. Next slide. So they raised the alarm immediately. They uh, emailed the volunteer coordinator and said, unless some management is done, we don't think the orchids are going to survive. DNR was able to get some funding to go out pretty quickly and do a prescribed burn to manage that habitat to ensure that the existing population continued to exist um, and that those orchids sur could survive. So there is an exciting example of on the ground management that was done specifically in response to data collected by volunteers. Now, Another thing that we've been able to look at with that same species is how the populations are doing across the state. Because we have volunteers who went out not just to that one site with the railroad tracks, but to multiple sites looking for this orchid. And they were reporting back regularly about the size of the populations and whether or not they were seeing reproduction. And unfortunately, we found from these reports that the populations weren't doing so good. The, uh, the groups of plants were really small and they were isolated and they didn't seem to be reproducing. They just weren't growing and it didn't seem like a very stable um, situation for the species in Wisconsin. Because of these ongoing reports from volunteers, we decided to partner with some other organizations and do additional hands-on conservation work. Next slide. So on this slide, we see hand fertilization of these orchids. We had staff and partners who went out in response to volunteer observations and hand fertilized using these tiny, tiny little tools um, in order to try to increase some of the genetic diversity in these plants and increase their ability to reproduce. This is an ongoing project where our staff and our partners are going out there hand pollinating. It's a lot of work, but it's work that we think is a high priority and we wouldn't have gotten to that conclusion without the information from our volunteers. So that's another great example of how we are managing our populations um, and how we are doing uh, hands-on conservation and prioritizing conservation work because of the data that volunteers are providing. Next slide. All right, uh, finally, I talked about regulation and regulatory decisions when we went over you know, the three ways that data can be used. So I wanna to touch on that briefly. In the United States, we have the Federal Endangered Species Act. 
This is a very powerful piece of legislation. It provides federal protection to threatened and endangered species. And the decision of whether or not a species gets that protection is made by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. And they base those decisions on the best scientific and commercial data available. That's what they're required to do by law. And increasingly, that best data is coming from citizen-based monitoring projects and from volunteers. I've got two examples here. Um, on the left, you see the rusty patched bumblebee. This is a bumblebee that we have here in Wisconsin. Um, I actually saw it earlier this week. I, I believe it was on Monday. And it's always great to be able to see just when I do my walk around the block, uh, see a, a rusty patch bumblebee. Um, so we have it here. It's listed as federally endangered. It was listed just a couple of years ago. And a lot of the recent data that were used in that listing decision come from volunteers, come from citizen scientists who are out on the ground observing and reporting. Similarly, on the right, we've got a picture of the monarch butterfly. The monarch is going through the listing process right now. It has been proposed for listing as threatened, and right now uh, Fish and Wildlife Service is compiling all the data and doing all the research that they need to do to decide whether the monarch should be listed and should receive this federal protection. A large portion of the field data that we have on the monarch butterfly in the past 15 or 20 years, 25 years, is from citizen-based monitoring projects, like the monarch larva monitoring project that I talked about um, towards the beginning of the talk. So these are projects that are resulting in high quality scientific papers and research results. Um, the information is being used at the highest levels of our regulatory decision making, which really just, again, demonstrates how important these projects are and how important the volunteers are who participate. Now, I'm not gonna tell you what a project needs to do in order to be worth volunteering for, because that's a personal decision. Um, that's something that, that you need to make, uh, you know, you need to decide that on your own. But again, I do strongly encourage you, if you're going to get involved in any capacity, please do make sure that you are comfortable with what the project is doing with your data and your time and your efforts. Next slide. So I strongly encourage you to get involved. I hope that I've shared a couple ways um, uh, to get involved that might be of interest to you. The best way, the simplest way is just go to our website. You see the URL there again. Uh, we've got a directory, an events calendar. We've got a list of DNR projects. We've got all sorts of resources for everyone. So that's a good place. Or, uh, you know, you, you certainly can just go directly to the website of any of the projects that I talked about. Um, just Google them or look them up in the directory. Um, next slide. If you don't feel like volunteering, you're always welcome to make a donation to the Endangered Resources Fund, which is the money the DNR uses for rare and non-game species work, including a lot of our citizen-based monitoring efforts. You can do that on your tax checkoff form, through direct donations, or by purchasing an Endangered uh, Resources license plate, like the Eagle license plates or the Wolf license plates that you've probably seen out on the road. So I thank you again for listening, and I certainly appreciate your attention. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has them. Thank you very much, Eva. We really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left if anybody has any questions for Eva. And I got to say, I am definitely inspired to, to help out. Great. Eva, this is Eric. I got a question just sort of about how you understand, I guess, the, the level of participation or the interest in these types of programs overall, like how would you characterize the people maybe of Wisconsin as well as at the national level in terms of how many people really want to do this and, and do you see that trend growing? Yeah, great question. Um, I think, you know, citizen science has been around for a long time. As I talked about the Christmas bird count, you know, over 100 years. We are definitely seeing more and more and more investment in that, both in Wisconsin and nationally and internationally. And part of that is um, just because there's more projects, more resources, the field is really coalescing. And so um, I don't know if it's necessarily that there's more interest in volunteers in getting, in getting involved, so much as it is that there's a lot of people who want to do something good and who want to participate. And now this is becoming more and more of an option for them. I do think that here in Wisconsin, we have uh, much more participation than in other states. I think part of that is um, just our, our sort of 
cultural land ethic and our cultural interest in, in giving back to our community and, and participating and being engaged. Um, Wisconsinites volunteer at very high rates, not just in this sort of like nature-based outdoor activities, but, you know, volunteering in, in um, youth groups and Red Cross and all sorts of other organizations. So uh, I, lots and lots of people are, are involved. Lots and lots of people are interested in getting involved. Um, you know, in the in Wisconsin, I think that we conservatively estimate it to be probably somewhere between ten and twenty thousand people are out volunteering in these programs. But I, honestly, I think that's probably underestimating it. Sure. Seeing if there's any questions from the field. My dogs are coming into the room too. You mentioned um, the collaborations with the Monarch programs at uh, at the Arboretum, and and it seems as though the Arboretum is also trying to sort of build a range of um, volunteer projects. Do you have any just kind of way to summarize what's going on at the Madison Arboretum and how those things can apply statewide? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so interestingly, there's a a personal connection for me there. Um, I did my PhD at University of Minnesota in the Monarch Lab, which is the lab that used to run the Monarch Lab Monitoring Project. And my PhD advisor actually moved to Wisconsin a couple years ago. So she is now the director of the UW-Madison Arboretum and she brought the Monarch Lab Monitoring Project with her. And um, she is, of course, a huge fan of citizen-based monitoring. And she's been using it in her own research for decades. Um, and she was very, and I'll speak for her, and I hope she's not on the call because if she is, I shouldn't be speaking for her, but um, I'll, speak, I'll speak for her and say that she was very excited to come to Wisconsin to a state where we have so many um, opportunities to get involved. And so they've been doing a great job, job at the Arboretum of, of becoming sort of a local host site for a lot of our projects. And they were doing some of that work before, but now they've really ramped it up. And this is something that we see not just at the Arboretum, but at places across the, st uh, across the state. So um, nature centers and outdoor learning centers, um, you know, Arboretums, uh, county facilities, county parks departments, uh, city parks departments are acting as local hosts for these statewide programs. And that gives people a local connection and it also allows us to um, get more into the community and find out more what the community is interested in doing um, rather than just having everything be run at DNR. Um, so yeah, the, the Arboretum is, is doing an amazing job. Um, places like Beaver Creek and Eau Claire, um, North Lakeland Discovery Center, uh, Urban Ecology Center, Upham Woods is getting more involved. There's just so many of these really hubs for citizen science throughout Wisconsin. We're very, very lucky to have all of them. We have a couple questions for you. Um, Ellen says, thank you very much. Such a wonderful information for all of us to know. Do you partner with the Cable Natural History Museum? Um, we don't do too much with Cable Natural History Museum. We've reached out to them a few times and we've, we've certainly talked to them. Um, I know that they have a couple people, a couple of their volunteers do some bumblebee monitoring and things like that. Um, that's just a partnership that as of yet hasn't really materialized, but they're doing some great work there. Uh, we have another one from Mary Jo. Fantastic job. Thank you so much. Like Sherry mentioned, I'm inspired by your talk. I am a volunteer focused person. Where do I look for contacts for the different programs, specifically the Odana uh, Rare Plant Monitoring Bumblebee Brigade and Wisconsin First Detector? Yeah, great question. Um, well, first for the Bumblebee Brigade, I'm the contact. So if you look at your screen right there, that's my email. So you can write that down and you can shoot me an email um, and I'll get back to you. In general, to find the contacts, um, you can go to the, um, the Wisconsin Citizen Based Monitoring Network website, um, which the URL was up on the screen earlier, or you can just Google it. Um, and we have a directory. So you can search through the directory, you can type in the names of those projects and the contact person will come up, the email will come up, um, or you can just Google um, and, and the information will come up. 
Um, the, and I can actually just tell you as well, uh, if you're looking for specific, specific names for rare plant monitoring, uh, the contact person is Kevin Doyle. He's at DNR. And for Wisconsin First Detector Network, uh, the, the contact would be Ann Pierce, and she's at Extension. Right, uh, a few more just kind of asking, do you work with land trusts and their networks of landowners and supporters? And do you work with the county land and water conservation departments? Yeah, great questions. Um, some, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say that we're involved with or, or that we're partnering with every single one of those organizations in the state. Um, land trust, yes. So uh, actually gathering waters, which is sort of a, a statewide organization for, for land trust here in Wisconsin, is a partner and is um, doing great work supporting us. Um, I oftentimes am asked to give talks at land trust. We have some land trusts who are interested in getting involved in monitoring. I would say, um, you know, there, that partnership isn't maybe as complete as it hopefully will be in a few years. Um, same with the counties. Um, there's a lot of counties interested in getting more involved, and we do see some counties um, really, especially in the uh, urban, more urban counties, really taking off with their citizen-based monitoring efforts. All right, well, we were, are almost getting to the end of our time. I want to thank you again, Eva, for joining us. And I'd also like to thank the, the partners and sponsors for the conference and especially Extension Lakes folks for helping us with all that, our technical, technical um, expertise today. So uh, thank you again, everybody, for attending. And you will be seeing another email coming with a survey attached to it. So, Eric, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add. Oh, I'll just say thank you to Eva and thank you to you, Sherry, as well. And thanks to everybody for participating in this, in this event. Uh, we wish we didn't have to do it virtually, but we're very happy that you were all able to make it. And uh, I wish you all a good weekend.